Welcome to Wooddale Church. My name is Chris. If you're not met before, thank you for joining us online as well. So would you stand to your feet and let's worship Jesus together? When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see the mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. Come on, lift it up. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear, I lay at your feet. Jesus, there's nothing impossible. Come on. When I see all the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Oh, God, the battle belongs. 
grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. And I praise God for what he's done. sung from this building and online and all over our campuses today, and I pray that it was pleasing to you, God. I pray that as we prepare to get ready for the message, that you open our hearts and help us to hear and learn what we are meant to learn today from Dale's message. We love you, and we thank you so much. In your son's name we pray. to Wooddale. We're so glad you're here. My name is Stacia, and I have the privilege of leading our women's ministry here. 
I'm also the mom of, a, of seventh and twelfth grade girls, and the reason that is relevant is because this morning is Move Up Sunday across the Waddell campus. That means that kids that are exiting their current grade level get to move up in ministry, and that's a big deal, especially for the third graders, for fourth graders who are moving into Tarman's programming, Heather's, Micah's, and more. So it's a big deal, um, and you'll be hearing more about that, or you'll probably hear about it from your kids if you just drop them off. So. Um, also, we have, starting a week from tomorrow, Camp Woods Kids, and it's a day camp summer program, day camp like summer program that is four days long in the morning. I have fond memories of what is now Camp Woods Kids, formerly VBS. Loved getting to serve there, loved getting to see what my girls were experiencing in the program. And I even remember just the flashback this morning as I was thinking about it. My now seventh grader, eighth grader, um, Paisley, was out in the backyard after VBS, and I heard her just singing out, Jesus, what a friend! And that was one of the songs that they were learning. So nothing makes your heart swell more than hearing what's overflowing to your kids in VBS. They are looking for more help, so we would love for you to contribute. <laughs> would love for you to volunteer as you're able. And again, it's called Camp Woods Kids, formerly known as VBS. Another quick story from a mom friend that shared, um, Harmony shared that a couple of years ago, they were not really well connected into a church, and she simply received an invitation to consider Camp Woods Kids VBS. And so they thought, well, we're not connected yet. I'd love that for my daughter. So she dropped off her daughter, and I know that first day is kind of challenging as you're meeting new people and seeing new faces, but by day two, her daughter was running down the hall to greet her teacher, waving at her new friends, and in that moment, Harmony realized that she was missing out on a community that they had not yet even known that they were missing. They experienced something new. The depth of learning and the spiritual growth that she saw in her daughter was impactful for her. They got connected at Wooddale, and actually now, three years later, she serves in VBS, she serves on our worship team, and their family has a faith community that they've grown with and they've come to love. So I'd love for you to thoughtfully consider who you might extend an invitation to for Camp Woods Kids that starts a week from tomorrow. Who could you send an invitation to? You might just change the trajectory of their faith life too. So thank you and this morning we're going to hear a message from our senior pastor Dale. lifestyle, the way in which we live our lives. It's something formed throughout a series of decisions, whether intentional or accidental. But if our lives are to reflect the lifestyle of Jesus, it should be built with care. And as we allow God himself to form what he will in us and through us and around us, our lives are soon collected in a beautiful compilation for God's glory and for our good. Welcome everybody to the weekend. And you probably noticed I'm standing here behind this beautiful platter of fruit, all kinds of fruit. You know, this is my favorite time of the year, spring into summer into fall, uh, not only because uh, it's just beautiful weather and nice and warm, but it's when you can get some of the best fruit and vegetables and uh, enjoy them all summer long. I remember when we were living out west every year, about this time, we would go about an hour away into a place called Brentwood and we would pick all kinds of beautiful fruit. I mean, raspberries and strawberries and boysenberries and lala berries and 
Marsha would make great desserts with that. We'd share it with our neighbors and our friends. Later on, we'd go out and pick these huge white peaches. They would just gush as you ate them. And you had to be really careful because they were so good and you got so excited about it, you would end up going to pay for them or realize you almost broke the piggy bank. I hope you enjoy fruit as well in the spring and the summer. And you might be wondering to yourself, great, Pastor Dale, but why all the fruit? What are you trying to say with all of this? Well, what I'm trying to say is that your life and my life in many ways represents this beautiful platter of fruit. What I mean by that is you and I, as followers of Christ, have been called to bear fruit. And as a result of that, people are supposed to kind of taste our lives and get a taste of what it's like to encounter Jesus. In fact, with each other as followers of Christ, we should enjoy so much being around each other because we give Jesus off to one another. So let me ask you a question. Spiritually speaking, how's your fruit? Spiritually speaking, are you attractive like this? Your thoughts, your words, your actions, your attitude. Is it something that people would want to come and, and pick and say, man, when I'm around you, I feel refreshed. I feel renewed. I get a sense that this relationship you have with God is real because, because I see all this fruit coming out of your life. Well, we're going to start our last season in our series Head to Lab, where we've been talking about learning to love God with our mind and also with our hearts. We've been wait, making our way through the Gospel of John together, and we're about ready to finish these next two months. And so this last season, I'm talking about lifestyle. How do you live the Jesus lifestyle? And in this first episode, I want to teach you the secrets of how to live a life that is spiritually renewed. How to live a life of spiritual refreshment. And I don't know about you, but that's something I desire in my life. I don't want my spiritual journey to be episodic, meaning, you know, I, I go through great times, then through deserts, and then great times, then through deserts. I, I want to be refreshed whether I'm on the top of the mountain or I'm going through the valley. How about you? So I promise you, if you listen to what I'm going to share with you from God's Word, you're going to find yourself with the secrets of how to live a refreshed life, no matter what your circumstances are. Well, let's see if God's working to deliver. We're going to turn to John chapter 15. If you want to do that with me as well. And we're going to look at the first 11 verses. Here's what it says. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Then look what he says. He says, you have already been pruned, okay, and purified by the message I have given you. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Let's stop for a moment because what Jesus in essence is saying is that when we come into relationship with him, and his word acts on our lives, it's, it's, like, it's like pruning shears. It, it begins to change and shape our lives so that we become more fruitful. He says, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. Pay attention to that phrase where Jesus says, I am the vine. We'll be coming back to it really soon. He goes on, he says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Can I ask you a question? Is your joy overflowing these days, these last couple of years? 
I've just come across a lot of grumpy Christians, and I've probably been one of them, where it's been more complaining than joy. But Jesus says we can have a life that is so renewed and so refreshed that we're always overflowing with joy, an inward sense of peace, an inward sense of calm. So what is this fruit that Jesus is talking to us about that he wants to bear through our lives since he's the vine? Well, all we have to do is go over to Galatians chapter 5, and Paul actually gives us a list of the fruit. We call it the spiritual fruit. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Notice it's singular in our lives. So really, it's, it's one fruit, okay? It's the fruit of love, but there are aspects or characteristics of this fruit. Just like over here at our table, we have this beautiful platter of different kinds of fruit. All together, they are fruit, right? And yet there's aspects of fruit. There's different types of fruit. Same thing is true in your life and in my life. So what are they? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Says there's no law against these things. Now, I want you to do something with me, okay? I want you to kind of evaluate how your love is expressing itself these days. So I want you to think about this in terms of, yeah, this, I'm not perfect, but this is a strength in my life. Or I want you to think in terms of, nah, this is an area that I could grow in. And if you're really brave and you're sitting next to your spouse or your, your dear friend, all right, uh, maybe you would even ask them to rate you. But then again, you may not want to do that, all right? So how are you doing when it comes to joy? Is that a strength in your life? Are you a pretty joyful person or is that an area you could grow in? How about peace? You know, peace that passes understanding. Do you tend to have just a, a sense of peace about you? Or how about patience? Whew, how are you doing with that area? I got a story to tell you about that later on. How about with kindness? How's that fruit in your life? Is it something that needs to be improved? Or, hey, it, you know, are things working out well and God's at work and, and you're a kind person? Well, how about just goodness? Or how about faithfulness? How are you doing in the area of gentleness or self-control. Boy, that can be a challenging one, can't it? All right? Think about those aspects of love. And if you had to choose just one of them to work on, which one would it be? Which of these aspects would you say, that's the one I, I'm going to work on? I actually have a book coming out this summer, hopefully in July, where I talk about how we can make the fruit of the Spirit a regular practice in our life, and it's coupled to my life's journey. It's kind of the story of my life and what I have learned by some things that have happened to me and that I've experienced that I wrestle with and, and how they've taught me how to, how to actually live out and integrate the fruit of the Spirit in my life, which is an ongoing work. And I'm hoping that'll be a blessing to those of you who may be interested in reading that book. We'll talk more about that later on in the summer. All right, that was a shameless plug, wasn't it? But I just know it's gonna be really helpful. And if I can share something from my life that helps you, then that's, that's worth it all. So that's what we're going to do. And I'll talk to you about that later on in the summer. But getting back to our, our passage of scripture, in essence, what I'm asking you is, if you were a fruit tree, which one do you look more like, all right? Do you look like this beautiful tree over here? I mean, look at that lush orange tree with all that fruit hanging there. Or you feel kind of a little bit more like this orange tree that looks like it's seen its last days. I mean, the oranges are kind of hanging there, but I'm not sure it's going to bear much fruit for very many more years. Which would you say is yours? I want you to know that this can be you. And this can be you on a continual basis if you learn these secrets of what it means to live a refreshed and renewed life. So, here we go. I'm going to give you the first one. Number one, spiritual refreshment begins by drawing on Jesus as our source of love and life. Spiritual refreshment begins by drawing, by absorbing, by taking from Jesus as our source of love and also our source of life. That's the promise that Jesus is making in this passage of Scripture. In fact, over again in verse 7, let me remind you, he says, but if you remain in me 
my words remain in you, you may ask for what you want and it will be granted. So if you are in me, he's saying, if you're attached to me, if you're relating to me, you'll have what you want. You'll get what you need. Now, what's really interesting in this passage of Scripture, and I told you to pay attention, is where Jesus says, I am the vine. Actually, in the Greek, it reads like this. I am the vine, the truth. Jesus says, I am the vine, the truth. Now, what's the difference between saying, I am the true vine and I am the vine, the truth? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll discover from prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah or Hosea, you'll see in Psalm 80 that God saw Israel as his vine. In fact, Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, it says that, that they're a luscious vine, that they're a vine that is producing wonderful fruit. But the warning in, in, in Hosea is that God is going to rip them out because of their corruption, because of their darkness. Their fruit is rotting. It's no longer any good. It's like those two trees. God says, you're this beautiful orange tree full of fruit. Now look at you. You think you're beautiful, but in my sight, the, fruits, the fruit is going away. It's gone. You, you look desolate. You look like you're ready to die. And so what happens is Jesus comes along in John chapter 15, and he says, and this was shocking to the, to the Jewish leaders who heard him say it, he says, no longer are you guys the vine. I want you to understand, I am now the vine. I'm replacing you in essence. And I will bear the fruit that the Father really wants. And only those who are attached to me will have the capacity then to bear that fruit. So it's no longer about self-righteousness. It's no longer about the law. It's no longer about being Israel. It's about being in relationship with Christ. He becomes the source. He's the one. So here's the question I'll ask you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is the Christ? Do you believe that he is the only source that can produce goodness and true love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control in your life? Until you and I come to that place where we believe that he's the only well we can draw from, he's the only source that can give that to us, we will struggle to be renewed. We'll struggle to be refreshed. We'll struggle to be fruitful in our lives, attractive and spiritually tasteful to others and to this world with our lives. That's why Jesus asked his disciples one day, who do men say that I am? And after they were telling him all the opinions people had about him, he said, but who do you say that I am? Remember, Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Do you believe that today? One of the evidences of, of believing that today is that you begin to bear the fruit of his presence, which takes us then to the second secret to being a believer who lives a refreshed, renewed life, and that is spiritual refreshment can only result from an infusion, an infusion of God's presence in our lives, an infusion of God's presence in our lives. I don't know if you've ever had an IV hooked up to you. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But you know, when they put an IV into you, it can be, for instance, if you're dehydrated, get fluids back in your body. And I remember uh, the few times I've been in the emergency room with my anaphylactic issues, uh, being totally dehydrated and having them stick the IV in me. And I could just literally feel myself coming to life again as that fluid poured into me and I, my body was being hydrated once again. Man, it felt great. I felt like I was coming alive. Or, or maybe you've had to have a, an IV to sedate you for some kind of procedure. Isn't that a weird, strange feeling? All of a sudden, right, they release the stuff in there, and whoa, you start to lose consciousness, right? You start to go out. In fact, I have a friend who had a bone infection, and they actually had to stick the IV right into his heart to get the antibiotics in there 
and, and then he had to take it every so often and had to take it very carefully because they wanted to get the infusion of the antibiotics into his system to stop the bone infection. Well, let me do some crude drawing here. Imagine, for instance, that this is the IV pole and this is the IV bag, all right? I'm going to put a capital S, and that stands for the Holy Spirit. And what we're talking about here is an IV that is put into your heart and my heart, okay, of the Spirit of God. So his big spirit, right, comes into my small spirit and I become infused with his presence. If you don't believe and live with that experience in your life, if you're not conscious of that in your life, if you're not alive with that in your life, you're not gonna be renewed, you're not gonna be refreshed. And I, I know in my own life, I'm challenged by this. And as I, as I look at so many Christians today, it's, it's as though there's no connection there. It's just up to me to try to live like Jesus in my own power and my own strength. And we fail miserably. We're not joyful. We lack peace. We're impatient. We're unkind. And all the things that, that we wrestle with, it just says to me that I'm not trusting the infusion of his spirit into my life. Right now, can you sense that you've been infused with the spirit of God in your life? Well, listen to what Peter says. I love this. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. I'd like you to get that kind of spiritually tattooed on the inside of your eyelids. I know I need to. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So look what he says. By his divine power, God has given us everything that we need for a godly life. How can that be possible? Because he has shared with us his what? His divine nature is what makes that all possible. His divine nature. He's done that for you and he's done that for me. That's the spirit's infusion in our life. So no matter where I am or what I'm going through, I always, I always have the capacity to live a godly life. The problem is we tend to focus on our outward circumstances rather than God's inward presence. And when that happens, right, when we start relying on ourselves and we're befuddled by difficult and challenging circumstances, it brings out of us not tasteful, beautiful fruit in our thoughts, in our words, in our behavior, in our actions, but what it brings out of us is oftentimes very rotten, <laughs> distasteful, and harsh, and difficult. And that's when you can really tell a person's character, isn't it? It's when they're going through a really difficult, challenging time. Well, I tell you what, I am a living example of what I'm talking about. Some of you know that I had the joy and the privilege, Marsha, my wife and I, of leading a group from Wooddale Church on a tour in Israel, which I just love to do with them. And something happened on this tour on the very last evening. The last two days of the tour, I'd gotten kind of sick. Actually, I'd gotten really sick. And uh, I was struggling and trying to kind of keep it all together. Uh, my stomach was really bothering me and all the issues that go with that. And uh, we were on our bus ride to the airport and our guide, my friend, said, everybody get your passports out. And I reached down inside my satchel, and I could not find my passport. I'll make the story brief, all right? The point is I never found it. I had lost it. In all of my travels around the world, I never lost my passport. But I lost it. I actually had to kiss my wife goodbye and say goodbye to the group as they left me stranded there in Israel because I can't go anywhere without my passport. 
Now, normally, I would be a big mess at that point. I'd be so uptight. And even though, you know, I know that, right, that that's my normal reaction to something like this, I felt a calm inside of me, a strange, weird calm. In fact, something inside of me was like, don't you think you should get yourself a little bit more worked up than you are right now? I mean, this isn't normally how you would be. And I kept thinking, what's going on here? And, I, and then I thought, well, this, is, this has to be the Spirit of God. So even though I wasn't you know, thrilled and I was a little bit upset, I was, I was able to get through it. And so what happened is that the next two days, I'm in Israel trying to get a passport. If you've ever lost your passport or had it stolen and you try to get one in another country, I want to tell you something. It is not easy. And I discovered that God was about to work on my area of patience. Patience is not a fruit that I easily bear. It's one of the areas I need to work on. And I was tested to every limit when it comes to patience. Very quickly, I had to go on the, inter on the internet. I'd get a hotel first, and I had to get on the internet. I had to go on the, all the websites. I had to fill out all kinds of forms. I had to try to get an appointment. The next morning, I, I waited to see if I got my appointment. I waited, I waited, I waited. Nothing was coming. It's like 9, 10 in the morning. I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do? Because I had booked a flight to get out that night. So I try one more time. Finally, I get a response back, and it says, oh, you can come in tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. to the embassy. So now I've got to change the booking of the flight, and I have to wait the rest of the day. So the next morning shows up. I get up. I'm supposed to get a cab at 7.30. The cab driver doesn't show up till 10 to 8. My appointment is at 8 o'clock. And on the website, it says, if you miss the appointment, you have to apply again. I, I am just sweating bullets at this point. And I'm getting kind of irritated. But there's nothing I can do. So we drive. Finally, we get to the embassy. And there's a long line to one little window. And I've got these people from other cultures that don't understand who are cutting in front of me. And by now, I'm just like, you know, I got to be careful what I say and what I do. I remind myself who I am. And, I, and in all of this, I'm talking to God at the same time. And I'm saying, God, I know, I know this is kind of a test for me. I want to be fruitful right now. But, but nothing, but no good fruit wants to come out of me right now, God. So I got to hang in there, right? And that's, that's what I try to do, hang in there. I get to the, the person I tell them I have an 8 o'clock appointment. I show them my cell phone, and they said, did you fill out the paperwork? I said, yes. I put it all online, like you guys said. He said, well, you also have to print it out and bring it. In my mind, I'm thinking to myself, why do I fill it out online if I've got to print it and bring it? You guys have it. But I didn't say that. I didn't say that. That would not have been kind. So he hands me the paperwork, tells me, go back and fill it out, get in line again. I go back out. It is hot. I'm trying to fill it out. I go back in line again. I wait. I get up there. I said, I'm supposed to have a flight at noon today. He goes, that's not going to happen. He says, but here. He says, go straight to the head of the line. See what they'll do for you. I go to the head of the line. I turn my paperwork in. I said, how long will it be? A half an hour? I look at my watch and I figure out I can still make the, the next flight. I get called up. I do the swearing in. I get finished. I pay the bill. They tell me to sit down. They call me back up. And the guy looks at me and he says, you're not going to get your... Uh, passport today. You're going to you're gonna have to wait about three hours. We'll give it to you at one o'clock. I said, my flight's at noon. He said, I'm sorry, one o'clock between one and two. We'll see you back. So now I have to reschedule my flight again. Now for later in that day, actually 12.20 a.m. Friday morning, I go back to the hotel. All right. I'm trying not to be stressed. I'm just working through all these issues. I have to go get an antigen test. I go back, I get my, I get my uh, passport finally, I get back to the hotel, and uh, there's a, 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 a huge parade going on, and now the question is, will my taxi be able to actually come and get me to take me to the airport? Finally, the taxi shows up, kind of late, gets me to the airport, but I look at my clock, and I've got four hours, four hours to get to my plane. This is not going to be a problem, except it was a holiday in Israel, and I've never seen the airport so full. I stand in line watching people scream at each other, get mad at each other, get confronted by security. 
I'm weaving my way in and out. I'm watching people cut in front of me. I'm telling you what, it was one of the hardest moments in my life to practice any kind of fruit of love and kindness and patience and gentleness and self-control. And yet I kept hearing the Spirit of God say to me, this is your opportunity, this is your opportunity, don't blow it. Trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. And so I began to pray for people, and I began to decide I'm going to do the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Make a long story short, it took me four hours, and I literally walked onto my flight and finally made it home. Now, in all of that that I just told you, God reveals something pretty special to me. And I'm going to tell it to you at the end here in just a couple of minutes. Because what God revealed to me is that when, for instance, you produce a certain kind of fruit, you know what happens? One fruit, if you produce that one fruit in your life, it actually gives birth to another fruit in your life. That as you learn to be patient, for instance, something else comes out of your life. You're, giving, you're given a bonus. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a few moments because there's a part of the story that I left out on purpose. All right, let's look at the third final secret. Spiritual refreshment comes by learning to abide in the presence of Christ living in us through the Holy Spirit. There are about 10 different times in those 11 verses where Jesus keeps saying, remain, 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 or abide, 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 abide in me, in me, in me. What does it mean to remain and to abide in Christ? Let me share with you three ideas. First of all, let the word of God act on your whole being. Verse 7. Go back and read it. Let the word of God act on your whole being. How many of you take supplements or vitamins or, or medicine? Many of you do, right? Well, why do you take that? Because you want it to act on you, right? You want it to produce some helpful medicinal, healthy, good response in your life. It's just, it's kind of like this fruit up here. You take fruit, you eat fruit because the fruit is full of all kinds of great um, vitamins and, and minerals and, and other kinds of things that your body needs. If you eat a healthy diet, this really fuels you up, right? So what Jesus is saying is, let the word of God, let the word of God act on your life, the pruning. Let it shape you, let it direct you, let it control you, let it guide you. Look what the scripture says in Colossians. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs of thankfulness in your hearts to God. So no matter what your circumstances are outwardly, whether you've lost your passport or you've lost your loved one or you've lost your job or you've lost your hope, Focus on the Word of God. Let the Word, let the truth of the Scriptures act on you. You know, one of the neat things that happened to me these last couple of days being stranded in Israel is I kept having hymns and choruses come to my mind. And one of them was the steadfast love of the Lord never fails. It never ceases. And all these things kept coming to my mind. And, and every time it came, I felt like God was saying to me, you have a choice. You can, you can be upset, uptight, and angry about your situation, or in this situation, you can see that I'm going to use it to produce some fruit in your life that wouldn't happen if you weren't in the situation. And so I worked on making that choice. Number two, rest in the unconditional love of God. Just rest in the unconditional love of God. There's this little song that maybe you've heard and it's, it talks about, you know, a love relationship between uh, two people. And um, uh, it says, I love you more today than yesterday. You know that song? I love you more today than yesterday. And then it goes on and says, and you know what? Tomorrow I'll love you even more. It's such a beautiful song, isn't it? But it's so not true, right? Because let's admit it, some days we can be a beautiful piece of fruit to people around us, right? And the next day we can wake up and be a rotten banana. We can wake up and be sour. We can wake up and just, uh, right? Because of what's going on in our life. And then people taste us, they, they, they come near us, they experience us and they're turned off. 
It's not, you know, it's not always easy to love somebody. It's not always easy to love them more, especially when they, when they don't treat you the right way. But here's the beautiful thing. I want you to know that Jesus loves you the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will never love you less, and he can never love you more because he loves you the most. No matter whether you're a beautiful, ripe piece of fruit, or you're sour, or you're pruned, he's going to love you. And you and I need to learn to rest in that unconditional love of God for us. Lastly, earnestly and sincerely ask God to produce the fruit of his presence in your life. Ask God for the fruit. You know, over in verse 9, it says something that I think we oftentimes misunderstand. It says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love, he says. And then he goes on, he says, and you can ask me for whatever you want, and I will do it. And I will do it. And so oftentimes we'll take that verse, right, and we'll say, Lord, here's what I want. We wonder why he doesn't do it. It's because we take it out of context. See, the context here is that he will do for you and me what we want in accordance with the fruit of his spirit. Look at verse 7 again. It says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and I, and it will be granted. I think what he's talking about here in the anything you want has to do with the fruit. Ask for joy, ask for peace, ask for patience, ask for kindness, ask for goodness, ask for gentleness, ask for self-control. Now, at the beginning of our trip to Israel, I asked the group to choose a fruit of the Spirit that they wanted to work on. And then we shared a little bit about how that was working in our life. I did not choose patience, all right? I chose something else. But evidently, God wanted to develop the fruit of patience in my life. And so he allowed me to go through that gauntlet. Now, I'm not saying God pickpocketed me and took the passport away. I'm just simply saying God used whatever unfortunate circumstance, my fault, I lost it, all right? But he still used it to bring out a fruit that he's wanting to develop in my life. And that is patience. And I just want you to know, while I had some slips and some moments, I want to give glory to God and say to you that every step of the way, I felt the Lord saying to me, you have a choice, you have a choice. You can act in your flesh, you can respond to this in a carnal way, or you can let me bring this fruit out of your life. And you can be patient and you can wait. And I just kept my focus on that. Well, on the second evening that I was in Israel, because I couldn't get my passport till the next day, I decided I would call somebody to, you know, see if they wanted to spend some time. So I called my friend, our friend, Mitch Glazer of Chosen People, and I said, is there anybody here in Israel? Actually, I emailed him. I didn't call him. Is there anybody here in Israel on your team that I could, you know, maybe get to know this evening? And he made contact with the director of uh, Chosen People Ministry there in Israel. And he was gracious enough to respond to me. His name is Michael. And Michael came over and we spent an hour and a half together. And by the time our hour and a half was done, I said to Michael, you know, Michael, if the only reason I stayed here was so I could have this hour and a half conversation with you, it has been worth losing my passport. See, here's what happened. Michael, 33 years ago, fled the Ukraine and came to Israel. He has such insights about what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on with Russia and what's going on prophetically in the Middle East right now. I mean, I just listened with awe and appreciation as he shared his testimony. It's a powerful story of what happened in his life and his family, and I hope someday he'll be here with me to share with that story with you. But he ended by, by telling me that he has a radio program, and in this radio program, uh, he speaks in Russian. It goes out to uh, Russia. It goes uh, into um, other countries like the Ukraine, and people hear the gospel. He said there's been some young men that have been listening to him and had actually come to faith in Christ as a result of the radio program, and he had contact with them. 
And all of a sudden, there was no contact anymore. And one day, he got a letter from a woman in Poland, a refugee from Ukraine. And this woman informed him about her son. He said, my son had been listening to you on a regular basis. And he would always try to get me to listen to you, but I don't believe in God. That's what I would tell him. I don't believe in God. I don't need God. I don't believe in God. And she said, my son went into the militia to fight against the Russians. And one day, he and five of his friends were killed by a bomb. She said, I could not bury my son because I'm a refugee here in Poland. But I decided that since your message was so important to my son, I would start to listen to you on the radio. And I want you to know I've been listening and I have accepted Jesus as my savior. And then Michael said to me, and he said, this, he said it caused him to get on the floor and weep. She said to him in the letter, she said, now I understand that if my son had not died, I would not have become a Christian. So now I know I will see my son in heaven. When Michael shared that story with me, that's when I decided those two days were worth losing my passport over. What a powerful picture of what Christ has done for us. What a powerful picture of redemption. And all of a sudden, I just felt in my life, in my heart, I just, I just welled up with joy. Joy and marveling what God is able to do in even the worst circumstances. And I realized that patience in my life, patience had given birth to the joy the joy of hearing the story of redemption. Now listen, do you want to be spiritually renewed and spiritually refreshed? You know the secrets now. Trust in the Lord. Trust in his unconditional love. Let him infuse you with the presence of his spirit. Let it be the only source of hope for you. Learn to rest in that presence and ask God, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, Lord, what fruit are you trying to bring out of my life today? Lord, thank you for your abiding presence in our lives. Lord, bear your fruit in us and through us, we pray in Christ's name. We'll see you next weekend. What a wonderful message again from Pastor Dale and his reminder that God's presence is the place where we truly belong. And if you were reflecting on the fruit of the Spirit that you might grow in yourself, what came to mind for you? I know patience is not one of my best strengths until I recently heard that patience, the way you can look at patience is by considering or making a choice to go at the pace of the one you're with. So new perspective on patience, but think this week about what aspect of the fruit of the spirit you'd love to grow. And we would love to connect with you. So you received a connect card when you walked in. We would love for you to fill that out. And there's a black box out in the common space where you can put your connection card and your giving. And if you're like me, that's often without pockets, a purse, or cash, it's really convenient to go online or even use your phone to do giving through wooddale.org. That's become a handy thing for me to link my account straight to my Wooddale account, and then that's automatic and I don't have to worry about it. Um, we also would love to come alongside you in prayer. So if you have a prayer need this morning, I would love to stick around and pray for you. And there's also a prayer point outside of the worship center. So with that, thank you again for coming and have a great week.